you know, I never know whether to thank people for coming when it's kind of part of your obligation and you kind of have to be here. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is thank you in advance, and this is somewhat manipulative, for an engaging and lively interactive conversation and for participating um, and not making me stand up here and do a, a monologue because I'll bore not only you but myself. Um, so what I really would like is this to turn into a conversation. Um, feel free to disagree with me about things. I'm going to try to present some things that are essentially facts, that are just descriptions of the world. Um, and then I'm going to you know, make some arguments and, and, and present sort of where I think we should be heading in terms of how we serve, particularly men, um, in, in this sense, around complex families. So I should say um, that this is, so one of the reasons I was really excited to come to Wisconsin is Wisconsin has a, a long history of having across departments re doing really important and good work on family complexity. So a lot of the earliest big studies of single parenthood and divorce came out of Wisconsin. So there's this long history um, across social work, across sociology, across the Institute for Research on Poverty, um, the Center for Demography and Ecology of, of of really studying these issues. And I think that we're really seen as one of the key places in the world um, for studying these things, particularly in the US context. Um, and much of the work, which isn't particularly my work, but we're really um, known for our innovative child support policy work, which has um, largely been associated with the school of social work over the years. Um, I get asked a lot to talk to people about fathers, so government people or um, you know, classes or um, agencies or academics or policymakers. And one of the things I constantly argue is you shouldn't be asking me to talk about fathers. You shouldn't be focusing on fathers. You should be focusing on complex families. Because first of all, you know, when we think about fathers, well, father to one particular kid, fathers in general, fathers in you know, particular family types. You can have many different father roles. And what I, I would argue is you need to think about, and this is a, a very sort of social work way of looking at the world, but you need to think about the range of relationships and roles that these guys, that men are struggling with. And so it shouldn't just be simply about this one role as a father, which I would argue is somewhat ambiguous too, if you consider that families today are getting much more complicated than mom, dad, and joint children, right? Um, and so what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about you know, what do families look like. And I think this is, um, I'll show you lots of pictures of change over the last um, few decades. Um, and you know, thinking about what does that mean for pri primarily, in this case, thinking about men and men's roles. I'm happy to, a lot of the work, most of the work I do is actually on kids. So I'm happy to, to take some time sort of as an aside um, and talk about the kids and the mom's roles and those kinds of things, but I'm mostly going to focus on men. Um, I'm also happy to get a little sidetracked and I can skip some slides, we can figure out um, what's going to be most useful. Um, so I, I should just sort of start by you know, lots of um, the terms that we're going to use aren't real precisely defined. So even when we say fathers, I think that the, most people kind of automatically revert to biological father, whether they're living with the kid or not, right? But there's lots of different fathering roles. Um, so we can think about biological fathers who live with kids. We can think about biological fathers who don't live with kids. We can think about adoptive fathers who we tend to, in a research world, lump in with biological fathers. Um, and we can think about stepfathers or social fathers. Um, I tend to like the term social father better because I think stepfather often um, uh, implies married to the mom, et cetera. And, and um, more and more what we're seeing is a move toward cohabitation, right? So they're not necessarily married. I also think social father can be used more broadly. So it can be um, friends or relatives who play a fathering role. It can be um, mom's boyfriends who maybe live there or don't live there. Um, so it's really just sort of getting at the role. For the most part, when I say social father today, I'm going to be talking about 
either a mom's husband or a mom's boyfriend who predominantly lives there, so a cohabiting partner. Um, the other thing we think about, you know, I think disadvantage, we have a general sense of what we mean. And I'm going to talk about somewhat what's particular to disadvantaged families um, and, and somewhat more general. Um, but it gets used pretty broadly, yeah. I'm sorry, when you say social fathers, mm -hmm. are you also including like same sex partnerships? So, uh, yes and no, right? And so I think it depends. So I, w so I would def clearly use the term father to, to, to talk about same sex partnerships. Um, when I'm talking about social father, I'm usually talk thinking about someone who comes into a kid's life later. So that could be a same sex, you know, so it could be a biological or adoptive father's, say, new partner, who I would think of more in the social fathering role, versus someone, a couple who adopted together, I would think of them as both, you know, more in the general father, biological father, even if, you know, they're not. So, um, you know, lots, so I don't have a good answer, and these aren't really precise definitions, they're big categories. Um, I'm also gonna say, it's, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about same-sex couples today, and the main reason is we still don't have really good research, right? So my take on the research on for kids is that as, for the most part, so there's a limited body of research, we generally have relatively small samples. So if we think about um, uh, two-parent families in the U.S., there's roughly two-parent uh, uh, different sex families. There's roughly 60 million. If we think about same-sex parents, there's less than a million. So there's maybe a, between seven and 900,000 ish, right? So even if you do a big sample of families, then the proportion that you're going to get of same-sex couples um, is small, and it's harder to identify. So I will say that in general, so for stable same-sex couples, most of the research around kids suggests they do about the same as kids who are with stable um, heterosexual couples. So I think we know less about as, as same-sex couples, because we haven't studied them as long, and we haven't studied as many, as they break up and as they transition, we know less about that. And we do know that for kids who, um, you know, transitions and, and breakups and fluidity in relationship are complicated for kids in any relationship, right? Um, but I don't think we know if there's a difference between for same-sex and, and opposite-sex couples. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, so I think it's you know I'm not going to give you a precise um, definition of disadvantage either. I think we generally think of lower income. We generally think of of, of less educated. Um, many people would say a family that has a, a kid born outside of marriage is a disadvantaged family, right? So they've been termed in the research literature sometimes fragile families, right? And I think there are reasons to believe that they're fragile. Um, and I'll, I'll try to make those arguments, whether they're disadvantaged or not. I mean, I think, um, you know, on average, they are, you know, they do have less income. They, their kids do have poor outcomes and things like that. Um, whether we like that term or not, I don't know. Um, and then complexity, generally, um, we use as, as sort of a broad term for essentially anything other than two stable um, parents throughout childhood, right? The same two parents. Um, I'm going to actually argue that even if we're thinking, you know, is it complex to grow up in a single mom family throughout childhood, that may not be complex, right? It might be a pretty stable relationship. If you look at the data, for the most part, that's not exactly true because most adults date. And most adults continue to have different partners, whether they live with, they may or may not live with them, right? But there is some more complexity and fluidity. And I'm going to argue that that's increased over time. And what it, um, um, so the first thing I just want to say is this is uh, about a five, so most of what I'm going to talk about is from about a five year research study. I worked with a bunch of other people on it, um, many of whom are here at Wisconsin, some are at other places. Um, it was funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, um, but the opinions are only mine. Um, so, a little bit of motivation. So many of you may know this, but I, um, if, so it may be a review. The majority of kids in the U.S. now are not going to spend their whole childhood, so from birth to 18, 
in a two-parent family with both of their biological parents, and particularly biological married parents. Um, so most kids will spend some time in at least a single-parent family. Um, and this means that you know, when you spend time in a single-parent family, being exposed to potential other parent figures is increasingly common. Right? Um, and so I say up there, maternal repartnering is increasingly common, especially among young children. Really, parental repartnering is increasingly common. Um, one of the reasons that we focus a little more on maternal repartnering over parents in general is that most kids live the, 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 the majority, spend the majority of their time in their mom's households, right? But it's really parents is in general. Um, the uh, second thing we know is that disadvantaged groups, so lower ed uh, education, lower income, et cetera, are especially likely to experience family complexity and fluidity, right? So that means sort of changes in the compositions of the family. Um, and splitting sort of family roles across households. This means adults are increasingly likely to occupy multiple family roles, both within and, and across families. And so this is a little bit of what I was talking about. What do you mean by the father? So it's increasingly likely that um, a, a mom or dad lives with you know, a kid or two kids, and they're a biological mom or dad to one of them, and a stepmom or dad to the other one. Or to have a kids in multiple households that you may be biologically or, or socially related to. So these mean that you take on multiple parent roles. And for kids, it means that you have multiple roles across households. So you have different sets of parents and siblings, et cetera. Um, third thing, you know, there's sort of an immediate backlash. Often when you talk about kids in single parent families do worse than other kids. Kids in, in complicated families do worse than other kids. Um, it, I mean, it really is simply a fact that on average, if we just start with kids who, kids who grow up in any other family type versus those who grow up throughout childhood with two married biological parents um, or, or same-sex couple, um, on average, they do worse on almost every outcome that you can think of. Now, I want to say a couple things about averages, right? It doesn't mean every kid. Um, it means that on average, for instance, if 90% of kids in, in two, parent, uh, two biological parent married households, say, graduate from high school, right? And 80% of kids from single parent family do, right? That's a big difference. It means kids in single parent family are twice as likely to not graduate from high school than kids in a two-parent family. The vast majority are still going to graduate from high school, right? And so most of what we're thinking about is actually, you know, is that the majority of kids are going to do OK, right, in most of these areas. But there's a substantial number that are going to do worse, and that drives the average down, right? Um, and if you look across you know, the probability of being incarcerated, the probability of um, being involved with social service systems, the probability of um, performing poor on lots of measures of cognitive development and behavioral development and things like that, the average differences are there. Um, and sometimes you know, it's off of a small base, and sometimes it's a small effect, but the average differences are there. Um, What's, what's less well known is if you don't compare. So I argue often in my work that, come on, let's, it doesn't make sense to compare kids in two-parent biological married families to all other kids. Because look, I, I'm going to show you the, the majority of kids, who, or the large proportion of kids who aren't born in that situation to begin with. And secondly, once parents break up, the choice often isn't, do we get back together and create this stable family? The choice is, what do we do after that? And so what I would argue is, in many cases, yeah, we know that almost everybody else differs from those families. But let's look at, you know, if we care about um, kids' trajectories after that, let's look at, well, what happens when parents cohabit or marry other people and break up with those relationships and thinking more about the stability from that point on. And I often argue that the right comparison group is among you know, a mom, for instance, or dad staying single versus repartnering and those kinds of things, right? 
Um, and you get much smaller effects, by the way, when you do that. There's still some evidence that sort of instability and lots of changes have some bad effects for kids. Um, but the, the, the biggest gaps are always between those two parent biological married families, right? Um, and everybody else. So the second thing I'm going to argue is this, that this is really important. And it has really important implications for intergenerational transmission of inequality, of poverty, of disadvantage. Um, and the reason for that is what we've really seen is a divergence of, of family formation patterns. And so what we've really seen is more educated, more socially advantaged people get married later, um, have kids within marriage, have kids older, right? So they essentially have said, what I'm going to do um, is get my education, maybe, so these are averages, maybe live with a couple people, figure out some relationships, um, then get married, then have a kid, and, you know, and they're less likely to break up too. What we've seen uh, uh, on the other side is lower educated people have children much younger. They're much less likely to have kids. Um, uh, they have kids when they're less educated. They're much less likely to have kids in the context of marriage. And so what we're seeing is people who are already socio social or socially disadvantaged are having kids in situations that there's some evidence are, is less productive or less healthy for kids over time. Right. And so what we're seeing is essentially um, people who are already disadvantaged, um, their kids um, are potentially at, at additional disadvantage. And then this is also really important from a policy perspective. So policies in a wide range of domains, so if we think about food assistance, we think about SNAP food stamps, if we think about taxes, tax credits, earned income tax credits, child, uh, child tax credits, um, child support, health coverage, income transfers, all of these policies were essentially designed with the idea of you know, a, 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 you know, two parents and joint children, whether they lived in the same household or not. They were much less designed for the, the kind of complicated families we have today. Um, so are there questions on that before I go on? OK. So I'm going to essentially do uh, six things. Um, so first, we'll talk about how complex and fluid are today's families. Then we'll talk about what do these multi, multiple simultaneous roles mean for fathering. Um, third, we'll talk about what are some of the common challenges for father involvement. Uh, and then I want to sort of pull, up, pull out a little bit and talk about what do we, meet, what do we know about social fathers, because I think there's um, a lot of, of misinformation or old information about social fathers out there. Um, then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the, the policy landscape from fathers perfect from father's perspectives and put it all together and talk about conclusions and implications. Um, so one thing I should also say, so I am a social worker in MSW, but I'm really sort of a policy guy. Um, so I can talk, you know, I'm not a direct practitioner. So that's one of the ways that I'll want you guys to, to talk about what it's like to work with families and what it's like to work um, with dads and with kids and with moms in these complicated situations. Um, what I can talk some about is, you know, what do agencies feel like from dads? And what do they look like from dads? And how might we be um, more um, uh, um, attentive to dads' needs? OK. So how complex and fluid are today's families? Um, so what I, I said already, so, you know, so both children and adults are increasingly likely to be affiliated with more than one family unit, right? So that to be connected to people in a family way through um, either, either blood relationships or adoptive and step relationships and those kinds of things. Um, it means that both adults and children are, are essentially taking on multiple roles. And those roles, again, if we think of the father role but, or a child role, like being a biological father often has different implications and um, uh, obligations than being a stepfather, right? Um, the same for kid, being a stepchild or, or being a biological child often has different um, uh, implications. We also think, you know, the exposure to multiple parent figures, right, could have some benefits, right? You have the possibility of getting, um, you know, investments of time, of kindness, of love, of money, of all these things from more people, 
right? It also can have negatives um, because it's much more complicated to negotiate, right? And often those people have lots of pulls too. And you know, those people have to, to figure out a way um, to, to, to all function together. Um, the other thing that I think you know, there, that there's been le a little bit less attention to is you know, these aren't particularly, you don't you know, move into one family type and then that's it. Right? There's sort of this ongoing fluidity or transitions in and out of family types. So we're really talking about you know, full half and step siblings that may or may not live together. We're talking about, there's a, a new liver, literatures on couples living apart together and living together apart. So essentially, people that are um, a couple and they're together, and, but they don't live together for maybe the dad's incarcerated. Or um, maybe this, you get this a lot with um, uh, you know, people moving for jobs, right? Or with immigration things. Um, and then you get couples and there isn't a ton of US research on this. There's more in Europe on couples who are apart but living together. And that's essentially we've broken up, and we can't afford to establish two different households. So we're going to live together, um, but we really um, don't, don't aren't a couple anymore. And we actually do anecdotally see that more in the US. And, and there's a lot of talk about that in the recession, families not being able to afford to break up. Um, you know, so, so you know, what's a family gets more and more complicated. And then, you know, there's been a lot of, of things, particularly in the, in the recession, but somewhat before, about failure to launch and adult kids coming back to live with their parents. Um, and then when you get, you know, older parents living with, with, with their kids. So I'm not going to talk about all those families. I'm going to mostly sort of talk about um, biological and social families and their children, parents and their children. Um, but these are all ways that families are, are complicated. Um, about a third of kids in the US are going to spend time living with a parent to, to whom they're not biologically related. Right? So mostly here, um, we're talking about, about step parents. OK. Um, so now I'm going to show you the first picture. So this is a picture of kids. So this is a breakdown of kids who were born in 20 big US cities. So this is really. Um, nationally representative of kids born in large cities, so not all kids, um, between 1998 and 2001. And so of kids born in big cities in that area, 52% of their parents were married at birth. Okay? So 48% of them were born to unmarried parents at birth. So this is a little bit more um, disadvantaged than a, na than a nationally representative sample that includes non-cities, because cities have, have, have slightly more disadvantaged people. Um, the nationally, about 41% of kids are born outside of their parents being married. If you look at births to women under 30, it's more than 50%. So more than half of births to women under 50 are outside of marriage, or under 30 are outside of marriage, um, and 41% of all births. If you look at this, this urban sample, um, it's 48%. So the solid colors are between birth and nine, how many kids stayed in one stable family situation, as far as who lived there, not thinking about grandparents and things like that, just thinking about the parent figures. So of, of all families, about 50% didn't have a transition by age nine, and 50% did. Yeah? Do you consider families who married because of the pregnancy or because of the children? Um, so we can tease that out. Um, in here, I'm just looking at were they married or not. So there, I mean, part of what people argue is that largely what we see here is a decrease in shotgun weddings, right? So people used to get knocked up and get married, and they don't anymore. Um, now they just live together and have the kid, or don't live together and have the kid. Yeah? Um, it does, but it's, I mean, it's really rare in the nine months between pregnancy and the birth for the parent to die. Oh, oh, some of these transitions, yeah, but it's um, it's a small amount of the deaths. I do. It's a very small. It's a handful, but they are in here. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. When you say disadvantaged, um, what population are you talking about? Are you talking about minorities? Are we talking about? So this is just all everybody in cities. So this is so it's slightly more disadvantaged just because people who live in big cities, on average, are slightly less advantaged, right? So they're more like, and they're more likely to have. Um, Outside of marriage, but this is literally just a 
sample of 20 cities that represent the urban population in the US. So they weren't selected on being minority. They weren't selected on being low education. They were just selected on being in a big city. But what did you find like when they selected? What was the people that was? So it's slightly higher. So if you look at the, so it's slightly higher minority because you know urban populations are slightly higher minority. Um, it's slightly less educated, those kinds of things, that, which is um, representative of the urban population, right? So that's right, that they are, based on being in cities, you get a different demographic. Yep. Um, OK, so 50% of all families have no transitions. So the next block, the sort of checkers, is one transition. So that ascent, it means um, there was one change in the parents in the household between birth and age nine. The second one is two, and the third one's three or more. So of that other 50%, you know, roughly a third each are going to have one, two, and three or more transitions. If we look at the marrieds, right? So the marrieds, this is by age nine. 70% of the marrieds are still married and living together by age nine. 30% have broken up. Um, if we look at that one transition, so that essentially means your parents broke up and for the most part your mom, because most of the kids live with their mom, um, didn't have a new partner move into the house, either as a husband or, or a cohabiting partner. Um, and then you see about 15% had the mom, so then there's another group of a, roughly 10% that parents broke up, mom repartnered, broke up again. Or sorry, didn't break up again, stayed together. And then there's 5% where parents broke up, mom repartnered, broke up again. So if we look at the cohabiting at birth, right? So less than 30% by age nine were still cohabiting, the biological parents. So 70% of these kids had at least one change in, in family structure um, by age nine. And again, it's about a third, a third, a third. So a third of them, they broke up and the mom stayed single. A third of them that broke up and the mom repartnered and stayed with that partner. A third of them, there was at least one more breakup. Yeah. And um, if the cohabiting partners married, was that considered a transition or was it still a cohabitation? So they were considered, they would still be in the, uh, so they would still be in, in the, the they, they're not a transition. So they would be in a, in a stable relationship. Um, <clears throat> and some of them do. Um, it's, it's, it's not super common. Um, for single, for kids born to a single mom by age nine, 75% of them have had at least one, um, one family transition. And of course, the first one in that case is um, a guy moving in, right? And then, so one thing I want to say is, so there's this real question about with kids, you know, is cohabitation um, like marriage or is it like single parenthood? In the US, it's for the most part much more like single parenthood. It's not true in Europe, right? In many European countries, the, the cohabiting families look like the married families. But in the US, they really look much more um, like single parent families. We can also think about, so cohabiting without kids is a little, right? So you see lots of people cohabit pre-kids. And we're, you know, for social policy, we're much less worried about that, right? Um, so, um, so you will see, you know, uh, you know, without kids, lots of people sort of practicing they talk about for marriage, right? But it's without the kid being there. Um, okay. Good. Um, so I just want to quickly say these are the same kids. So this is the probability of ever living with a social father, so a mom's new boyfriend or husband who's not your biological dad, um, by age nine. So of all families, about a quarter are going to live with them. If, you're, if your parents were married at birth, it's about 12%. If they were cohabiting at birth, it's about 30%. And if your mom was single at birth, it's almost 50%. So, um, so lots of kids are going to be, are, are gonna be um, exposed to, to or spend time with social dads. Um, this is just to look at the, the proportion of birth to unmarried moms, right? So over a 30-year period, so a little bit more than 30 years, so about 14% of births in 1975 were to unmarried moms. So this is nationally across the whole population. By 2008, it was about 41%. And it's roughly in that area now. I want to make one thing really clear. This doesn't necessarily mean, so part of what this is telling us is that people within marriage are having fewer kids. 
right? So this is the proportion of all births that are married to unmarried moms. And remember what I said is that, you know, <clears throat> there's this splitting of, of more educated people are having less kids, they're having kids later, they're having kids within marriage. And so that means proportionally, as that part decreases, this becomes a bigger slice of the pie. So it's not all about there's this huge increase on that side. It's also about what's going on within marriage. Um, so then I, I want to sort of show you that most kids, the majority of kids who are going to be born to unmarried parents are going to become parts of, of complex families. So this is looking at mother's first births in Wisconsin, actually. Um, and so the yellow, the yellow period is the, that there's no siblings, right? So they can't have any full siblings since the mom's first birth, right? The blue is the dad already has kids with another woman, right? So of this Wisconsin sample, for mom's first births, you know, in about, you know, a little, about 75%, um, there are no other siblings. And then roughly 10 or 12%, the dad already has um, kids with someone else. So if we look by age one, a few of them have had more births. They're largely full siblings or, um, in some cases, um, other half siblings. If we go all the way to age 10, right, 70% um, of them, or 70% so of them have had a sibling by age 10, right? Among, you know, if we, about, you know, a little less than 40%, that's a full sibling, right? So in these, so 40% of these families, Right? There's either an only child or full siblings. If we look at the other 60%, the majority, either the mom, dad, or both has had kids with someone else. Right? So most of these families, if you're born to an, uh, an unmarried mom on average, you're going to end up being in, in, uh, in a complex family. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the other thing that, that makes this even more complicated is people that um, have multi-partner fertility, so have babies with, with more than one person, male or female, um, they tend to, to select into each other. So the more kids a mom has with different partners, the more likely those partners are to have kids with different moms. So here if we look at, this is moms who have only one child across the bottom, um, and this is so, so this is the number, and then this is by number of dads. So if a mom has only one child, 60-some percent of the dads that she has a child with only have one child, right? Um, and about, you know, 15% or so, the dads have two children. If we get to a mom has four kids, right, only, you know, less than 40% of the dads have only one kid, right? And so if we look at that top block, so that's moms and dads who both have four or kids with four or more people. Sorry, it's not just kids. Right, so we're talking about 12% of the moms and dads. But if we look at that whole section, you know, more than one partner, they're, they're, they're matching each other, right? So this makes it more complicated. So it's not about everybody has one kid with, with two different people. It's really about like people who are, um, uh, who are either having, you know, who are matching with more, multiple partners. Um, so this is uh, just to look at over 20 years. So I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures on these two samples. So this is not an urban sample. This is nationally representative of all people who were adolescents in 1979. So between 14 and 21 in 1979 is going to be um, the black line. And all people who were 14 to 21 in 1997, so roughly 20 years later, is going to be the other line. And so what we see is, so this is the likelihood of having more than one parental role. So being both a step parent and a biological parent. Being both a resident biological parent and a non-resident biological parent, et cetera, by age 30. So we're following people from 17 to 30. And so this is men. And so people who were adolescents in 1979, by, uh, by age 30, a little less, seven or, about 7%, a little less than 8% of them had had more than one father role. All right? So that's doubled in the next, last, next 20 years. So about 16% of them have had more than one father role by 30. And this is the whole population, right? OK. Um, second, 
So this is looking at the probability that you lived with a biological child. So these are all people who live with a biological child by age 30. Um, and these are men. And these are in, the re in particular relationship types. So the blue line is that earlier group, so the, the ones who were adolescents in 79. The green lines are the ones who were adolescents in 97. Um, the circle, right, is married. So 40, a little over 40% of men by age 30 um, in the earlier cohort had been married and living with a biological child. Right? So if we look at the 20 years later, that drops to less than 30%. So you know, it's a pretty big drop. It's a 25% drop. Um, if we look at you know, back in that earlier cohort, so the square is cohabiting and the triangle is single, right? Less, you know, about 5% of men were cohabiting and living with a biological child. You know, that increases almost four times, right? And, and, and I sort of showed you that cohabitation is less stable in the U.S., right? So we see this big shifting where the marriage drops, right? And the cohabitation with kids, with biological children, increases a lot. We also see some increase in, in single, single fathers. Okay. Um, if we see for moms... We see basically the same pattern. So that circle, this, the drop of the circle is the probability of having been married and lived with your biological kid. Um, then we see, you know, way up there, the, co the having been co single and cohabiting. So the squares cohabiting was way down here for the earlier cohort. 20 years later, right, it's roughly not quite tripled, right? So really big changes in these family roles. Um, if we look at, so this is men, and this is the probability by age 30 of ever being in, situa in, a, in a family where you lived with a social child, a stepchild, whether you're married or not. Um, so we look at, in 1979, you know, uh, less than 2% of men had, had, been, had cohabited with a, with a stepchild. By in the 1997 cohort, it's 11%, right? So that's, you know, a 500% increase. Um, if we look at, um, you know, and then you see, you see the difference in marriage. If we see the, um, uh, uh, so I'm not going to spend lots of time on each of these. If we see the, thing, the picture for moms, for women, it's the same pattern at a much less lower rate because men are more likely to move in with a mom and her kid than a woman to move in with a dad and his kid. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, but the same kind of pattern. Um, so if we look at, um, the probability of men having non-resident children, right, by, by the, their, their marital status, et cetera. So if we look now, by age 30, 20% uh, of men had spent time being single and having a non-resident child. Um, that actually isn't a huge increase. In the earlier sample, it was, you know, about 16 or 17%. Um, what we see again is this big move. In the earlier sample, men were considerably less likely to have been single and had non-resident child, um, you know, a smaller gap, but a really big gap about cohabiting. So men are more likely to, to go on to cohabit and have a, a non-resident child. So the same kind of story. Um, same thing for women, but, but much more collapsed again. Um, and then I want to show you some of these differences by um, just by, you know, some measures of, of race, ethnicity, and education. And so what we see, if we look at the total, so this is the probability that you've had multiple parental roles by age 30 in the two cohorts. Um, so total, you know, it was in 1979, you know, 13% or 14%, and it's up to about 20% overall. It's increased for all, um, all racial and ethnic groups. It started higher f for blacks and Hispanics than, um, than, than whites. Um, it's increased somewhat more for whites and blacks than Hispanics. Um, if we look at education, right, we see roughly really big jumps for all groups except those with a bachelor's degree or more. So again, this is basically a story of stability, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, among the, the higher educated groups and less so um, among less educated groups. And again, this is what I'm going to argue is, um, why we may want to be worried about this from a policy perspective is, so if you're already likely for your parents to earn less money, right, and already likely um, to, 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 to go on to, to, 
to be less successful in some ways, because we know parental education is associated with lots of stuff. Um, and there's, there's more probability of relationship churning. What do we do to help kids largely? And I'm going to argue one of the ways to do that is to help dads um, succeed in those situations. And I think there was a question. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to clarify. Was that just for men, or was that both men and women? I believe that was, that was both. Yep, yep. So that's just. So the, so the numbers of the proportion of people getting bachelor's degrees has risen, risen over this 20 years. And yet, so the proportion of um, people that are maintaining these multiple parental roles is also rising. How do you account for? So this is just a cross tab. So, it's, so we're not taking that into account. We're just saying among those who have this education status, what's the probability by age 30 that you've been in multiple parental roles? So we're not adjusting for any of that. This is just the basic. Undermine your overall trending data. <clears throat> so I can. So we can. So I'll get to some multivariate analysis. But this is just the trend that what's essentially happening is people. So it may be people are getting more of this, right? But those people who decide to do that are, you know, are less likely to have multiple partner parent roles. Part of it is because they're delaying parenthood, right? right? So you can't have multiple parent roles if you're not a parent, and you can't, right? So yeah. Um, when you're talking about living with, are you accounting for custody arrangements? So like, is it primary custody, or is it just like if, even if dad only has the kids once every other week? Yeah. So when we're so we're defining it here just for a simple, so we can look at some of that stuff. The simple cut is majority of time with the mom. So so I have done work on looking at you know equal shared and and other things like that. For most of these simple cuts, it's just majority of, of work with the mom. We have moved much more towards shared custody arrangements, or, or um, largely, they're still infinitely more common among divorced families than never married and particularly never lived together families. But they're, they've increased a lot among all of them. So, and you do see some differences. Yeah. Uh, was there another question? OK. All right. OK. So when we start thinking about the, the, you know, people's lives in, in regard to family and how they interact with each other and, 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 and systems, so most of our policies and most of, of you know, historical design was thinking about you know, this, this two-parent family. I know my, my um, colors are sexist. I cribbed it from someone else. Um, and, and, and I'm not that technologically savvy to work on. I guess I could have figured out how to change colors. Um, Anyway, so we think about it like this, and then we say, OK, so we got these two parents and these two kids, and they're supposed to provide for the kids. They're supposed to give them. Um, they're supposed to earn money so that they can invest in things and buy things. They're supposed to take care of them. They're supposed to give them time. They're supposed to give them love. Um, they're supposed to teach them to read and write and behave and all that stuff. And then we say, OK, so what happens when they divorce or they split up? And so, <clears throat> you know, so then we kind of move the dad off to the side. And traditionally, I mean, even in like the 70s and early 80s, the argument was what's important from dads is child support. And the dad's role is largely to contribute economically to families. And for the most part, even in the 70s, the dad's role within that family, before any kind of split up, was seen as primarily being the breadwinner. So that's changed dramatically. Now we expect dads, right, to provide resources. We also expect moms to provide resources. And we expect dads to be actively engaged in child rearing, right? And in some sense, you could think about policies being easier or simpler if all dad was supposed to do was send a check. Um, but we kind of found out dads actually mean a lot more for kids than just a check, right? Uh, so we can look at you know, another family. So OK, so then they've split up. Well, so now this guy comes into the picture, right? So now we have to figure out. So what should he contribute money-wise? What should he contribute money-wise? What should they each contribute um, in terms of time and child rearing? And what about, well, maybe this kid wasn't his kid. It was his kid, right? So this gets a lot more complicated. And it gets a lot more complicated for each of these people to, to, to figure out where they fit in with each other and what their roles are regarding each other. And so then what happens when, you know, maybe he now repartners and has another kid? With her. Or, you know, maybe she even had another kid with somebody else. Or maybe they repartnered and split up. So this is what we're really talking about is figuring out how do we make programs and policies that work for families like this. Right? 
So it may not be that complicated, but I would argue even if, you know, even in that last picture, if you just have these two, you know, it's complicated enough. Um, okay. So what do these roles mean for fathering? Okay. Um, so let's think about what dads do for children. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about dads for a check, but I think our laws are still in a way that dads are still a bit of a check. It's not really what they can do for the kids. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I actually agree with you. And so we're, when we get to the policy part, so toward the end, we're going to talk a lot about that. So I think that um, particularly, so I think that laws have gotten better. Don't get me wrong. But fathers face more uphill battles in court. It's easier, for instance, to um, you can have somebody go out and uh, you have child support enforcement who will enforce your right to child support. It's much harder for dad to have his rights to visitation enforced. Right? Um, there are lots of ways that I think that I'm going to argue the, um, uh, a range of systems that serve families are either not dad friendly or at least perceived by dads as not being on their side. And I think that there's a lot, and even, and I'll even argue, so I'm giving away some of the later stuff, that we still want to check from dad, but we're not giving him the same kind of economic opportunities and supports that we give moms. And so, and so this is going to be a lot, a big part of it. So, yep. Yeah. So related to that, and this might require you get require you to get sidetracked. Um, if we could touch on there's a, this recent kind of social work in the media thing in the news um, about a county nearby that's doing public shaming of the people who are not. If, I don't know if we can touch on that later and some thoughts that you might have. So on I don't that. know that I know much. So the public shaming for the non-paying child support or for. So there's I don't know justice. That. It, I think it was Adams County just this week. Yeah. There was a news article about Adams County um, publicly shaming um, parents who are not providing child support by hanging up their pictures in local areas around the. the and I was wondering if you had heard about that. If you I had heard about it. So okay. It, if you wanted to, had any thoughts about it. Actually, I came from a state that they did that. Okay. Um, to, and what they did is they basically had a big article and they put everyone's face in that article. So I, yeah, I've heard about the things like that in the past where they're top, you know, 10 deadbeats or whatever. So can you guys remind me to come back to, so I, so I don't want to do it quite yet, but we're going to spend some time talking about child support and just bring that back up again, okay? Um, so what I do want to say in these families is, so, the, and we'll, so we'll get to it more, but the way child support works, right, is a percent of your income for each kid, right? And as you start, it gets harder and harder to pay child support when you have kids, <clears throat> when you have multiple kids, but particularly when you have kids in multiple families. So if I have two kids with one woman, my child support owed is a lot less than if I have two kids with two different women, right? And so we'll talk about that. Um, okay. So, so what do dads do? So economic contributions, clearly, whether you live with a kid or not, economic contributions are important. Um, second piece is we think about involvement in child rearing. Right? And so we really, so there's sort of a, a um, typology where we think about sort of four main areas um, uh, for fathers. And so one's about engagement. So that's actively being involved with kids, reading to kids, playing sports with kids, watching TV with kids, spending time, taking them on outings, eating meals with them, doing things with kids. And so that's where most of the existing research has been. The second piece is really about accessibility. And accessibility is essentially, you might not be directly engaged at the time, but a kid can come get you or can contact you easily. So you know, you're in the house and you're cooking dinner and the kid's playing in the other room. Or you're a non-resident dad um, and the kid's with the mom, but they can call you easily or, or drop by. So you're accessible to the kid, but you're not actively engaged at that particular time. right? <clears throat> the third's responsibility. And so this is largely around making decisions, right? And this comes into play a lot more after families break up, right? So who makes decisions about um, schooling or religion, what kind of clothes to wear, friends, curfews, all of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> doctors, have, have medical care. Um, and the fourth is what we sort of think of as indirect investments or supporting moms. So that's essentially to what you can think of it as co-parenting, right? 
So to what extent are they on the same page? Do they support each other's rules and routines? Um, and so the one thing I should say is, the first thing is most of the research in all these areas for men, and I think this is really problematic, has been about quantity and not quality. So when we do parenting assessments for moms, and we do the moms engage with the kids, she's doing this, we thought, think about how warm is she? How receptive to the kids' questions is she? What, what are those interactions like? What does the mom talk about? For dads, we go, how many times did you eat with the kid in the last three weeks? You know, or how many times did you read to the kid in the last three days? So it's much less about qual quality in the research. So I would argue that quality is really important in reality. Um, but so one thing, so we think about, and I think this is problematic, and I think it goes to your point about thinking about dads in different ways than mom. We're often just checking boxes for dads instead of really thinking about what these relationships are like. Um, second thing is, so I'm going to argue that disadvantaged men may have less capacity to invest in each. And so the reason I'm going to argue that is economic contributions is easy, right? You have less money, therefore you can give less money, right? But second, their lives are, tend to be more complicated, so there's more demands on less money, right? Third, they have less control in many ways over their external environment. So I have a job where I work a lot of hours, but I have a lot of choice about when those hours are. Right? I um, have lots of um, you know, options around responsibility. Right? And many of my options are good. If I had less money, I would have both fewer options and fewer good options. Right? Um, so I would argue that there's less ability in many of those areas. Um, and I think even if we think about supporting moms, having less money plays out in lots of ways. So it plays out in ways where, and you'll talk to moms and dads. Dads don't want to go around because they can't afford to take the kid out to eat or to buy the kid some shoes. And moms are pissed off at the dad because he's not contributing in those ways. So you know we know that, that lower income status is associated with stress and those kinds of things. So I would argue it makes it a lot harder. Uh, it takes a lot more effort to engage the same amount in those areas if you're lower income than, than if you're higher income. OK. <clears throat> so now I'm going to give you sort of the most academic part of the talk. But I actually think there's a lot to this. And I think it's actually really simple. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of body of, of work of theory called identity theory. And there's a, there's a book by Birkenstetz that, that sums this up really nicely. And so the idea is about how we take on different identities and what they mean. And so here's the, the, the simple take on it. So we have roles in life, right? So you're a student, you're a father, you're a mother, you're a sister, you're whatever. Um, and so those roles are actually just the social role. But the identity is the meaning you attach to it. So for, me, for all of us, there's a different meaning to being a student, right? And they probably cluster into groups. Or a different meaning to me for being a, you know, an academic than you know, some of my colleagues, or to being a father. And arguably, so when we talked about these different father roles, stepfathers, biological, resident, number, so all of those things may take on different meanings. So these meanings are also fluid, right? So they change depending on who you're interacting with, what your context is, different times in your life. Um, and the essentially idea is they get arranged in a hierarchy by level of importance or salience, right? Um, and that hierarchy changes depending on where you are. So like right now, you know, being a teacher, a researcher, whatever, is you know, kind of at the top of my, my list. Usually on Saturday mornings, it's pretty far down there, right? Um, and so it's really going to depend on, on, on who I'm interacting with. And so the, the basic idea is that we adapt these meanings. And what we do is, we, identi you know, we go through this sort of psychological process that they call identity ver verifications. And what you really want is to get positive feedback, both from the people you're interacting with in that role, that you're good at it, that you're essentially meeting your own identity, your own uh, definition of what it means to be good in that role. And you want to sort of get your own assessment that you're doing a good job in that role. Right? And so the idea is that. I, um, you know, in my role as a 
giving this talk today, I want to feel like, yeah, I nailed that talk, right? I want to feel like I kept them interested and engaged. I want to feel like I, you know, I didn't sound like an idiot. I gave them good information. And I want to feel like, and they appreciated it, right? And they thought, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about, right? Um, and this guy really cares about these families. So I want both, you know, sort of my own assessment and your assessment to match and to say I'm doing a good job around the things that I think are important in this role. OK. Um, and so there's been lots of research, not so much interestingly in the family literature, but in other literatures around jobs and things like that, that this identity verification, that when you feel like you're doing, you're meeting your expectations, and you believe other people think you're meeting your expectations, has lots of psychological benefits um, and strengthens group bonds. Right? People get along better. Um, by contrast, so when there are conflicts in the definitions, or you know, conflicts or discrepancies, both within yourself or with other people. So for instance, um, I could have you know, this, this clear idea of what it means for me to give a good talk to you guys. right? And you guys might have a totally different idea of that. Right? And when we have those different ideas, right, I'm unlikely to feel like I did a good job today and satisfied your needs. And that's going to cause me some emotional stress right, or, or some emotional discomfort. So let's think about it in a two-parent, um, two, two parent, two, one kid, whatever, intact family. It's hard enough, right? So what's it mean to be a good dad? Like, you know, my um, take on how much I should be working or doing this versus my wife versus my kids. So it's hard enough there. But it's relatively likely that we can come to some kind of agreement, some kind of equilibrium. So now let's think about, I'm, um, I'm, I split up with my wife, um, and she has expectations for what I should be able to, to contribute money-wise, time-wise, um, you know, how our relationship should go, what it means to be a non-resident father. And I have expectations. And you know, maybe. I have lots of competing things, and I want to still be good at my job, and I want to go out and date, and I want to do it. So there's much more opportunity for conflict there. Right? There's much more opportunity for me, to think, for me to either not be able to meet her expectations, which means I'm not getting good feedback, right? or maybe not even be able to meet my own expectations. Right? So then throw other people into the loop. I have a new kid with a new woman. Well, she has some expectations of me. So does my ex's expectations change or not? So the more complicated these relationships get, the idea is, the more opportunity there is for people not to be on the same page. Right? And when people aren't on the same page, um, you get much more anxiety, you get much more distress, you get much more um, conflict. And all of this is associated with decreases in self-esteem and sort of decreases in, in psychological and emotional well-being. Right? And so what do you do in response to that? So there tend to be a couple of different responses. So one thing is you might change your behaviors. So you might say, you know what? Um, you know, my ex thinks I'm not being a good enough dad. I'm not spending enough time. I'm going to nail this. I'm going to be there you know, for every, every opportunity I can. And you know what? Even if she, she makes me angry, I'm going to bite my tongue, and I'm going to be really impressive. You might change your, your expectations, right? You might say, revise your standards and say, oh, you know what? She's right. I'm going to, you know, uh, it's not that I'm just going to change my be behavior. She's convinced me what it means to be a father um, is different than I thought, right? Um, you might also change it the other way around, right? Um, so, one thing that, that, you know, another response is to essentially, um, reorder your hierarchy. So I might say, you know what, um, being you know, involved in the, with my prior child is less important to me now than being involved with my new kid. And I'm changing that hierarchy. And so there is some evidence, um, largely from qualitative research, of, of, of what they call serial and selective parenting. And so essentially, there's um, a body of evidence that Often what will happen is men will have a child with, with, a, with a woman. Um, they will be very involved. Parents break up. 
right? They're somewhat involved, but, but somewhat less. And then once they meet a new woman, they get, become much, much less involved with that kid, but they essentially transfer the high involved parenting to the next kid, right? And so that's partly about changing the, that hierarchy. The other thing that you may want to do is say, look, this causes me great stress, and, and you may not want to, but people do, is, you know, is essentially avoid the situation. So I'm not going to deal with that role. I'm not going to deal with that person. It's too stressful, right? And this, remember, this may also be about things like money, right? So it may be, you know, you're, you feel that in order to be a good dad, I also have to have money to contribute to this kid. Or, you know, the other parent feels like in order to be a good mom or dad, you also have to have money. And you're not meeting your part of the bargain, right? So there's lots of ways that these identities can come into conflict. OK. Um, so if we sort of think about how this plays out, so we can think about, um, so I gave you the example of, uh, of sort of you know, the, the, the two-parent you know, kid family. And so in those ways, there's likely to be much greater meeting of the minds, <laughs> or much greater um, <clears throat> common definitions of these identities of these different roles. Now, these change it all the time. So when you, you know, when people have a kid, that's a great big change in identities and roles. It changes your relationship with your partner, right? It changes your relationship with in many, many aspects of your life. So I'm not saying these are all about breakups and things, right? So having a kid is actually quite hard on relationships. Um, but you know, in the simplest forms, right, uh, um, and particularly the simplest form, like we could say marriage without any kids, right? Relatively clear for most people's sense of the big picture. You're not supposed to cheat and blah, 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 right? And then it's, you know, then you get a kid and your roles around, you know, how much am I supposed to work and provide money? How much am I supposed to be, have childhood? How, how much are we supposed to have sex? All these things become more complicated, right? And then as relationships break up and new relationships come in, it gets harder and harder. So what we would expect is, the simpler the family form, right, the less opportunities there are for these identity incongruities, right? Second, any kind of trans transitions necessarily um, mean changes in identities and roles, right? And so that necessarily means a new adjustment for everybody about what does your role include now that you also have this other thing, right? So right away, any kind of transition, even transitioning from cohabitation to marriage, often implies new sense of what that identity means and renegotiation. Third thing, I would argue that identity verification becomes more difficult, right? Because there's more roles, more obligations, and more negotiation between different players. You're getting pulled in different ways. Um, and so finally, I would argue for these reasons, we would expect right, more conflict and more difficulty getting everybody sort of on the same page or achieving identi identity verification as families get more complex. So relatively simple idea, but I think it's really important to think about how hard it is right, to coordinate and facilitate all of these relationships. Um, so what, so what are the, some common challenges to father involvement? Okay. So we know so, some of them, right? So some of them, so we know that greater access to human capital. Um, so we know that, so, you know, time and money facilitate involvement, right? Uh, there are lower transaction costs when you are, have greater human capital in many ways. So you can afford to contribute. You um, have better access to transportation. You have you know, more stable environments. You have more control in your work life, often things like that. Second, so we know that experiences with own fathers or male role models are important. So the better experiences um, men have had, the more involved they like to be. So we know that identification with the fathering role. So when men are asked about what it means to be a father, Right? The more they identify with that role and how important it is and how high it is in their hierarchy, the more they involved they are. Um, and then relationships with 
essentially in, in, in this talk, women and the, the women's relatives are really important. The better you can get along with your ex, right? And remember, it's not a one-way relationship. The more you see your kid, in many cases, the better you'll get along with your ex. And um, the better you get along, the more you're going to see him, partly because the more she'll let you see him. Um, and this often, we, there's some evidence, spills over into other relationships. So often getting along with your ex's mom is kind of important, too, because the mom can help facilitate it, things like that. Um, we also know that less involvement is, is associated with mental health problems, with being incarcerated. Um, the more demands you have on your time, the further you live, if you have you know, transportation issues, um, or unstable living arrangements, or gatekeeping. And the gatekeeping is essentially a mom who doesn't want you to see your kid. Um, and then the other thing that becomes really important is we see that both when moms repartner or when dads repartner, we essentially see drops in dad's involvement with, with the existing kid. So if a mom gets a new boyfriend or new husband, dads spend less time with them. And I'm not saying if that's the mom does more gatekeeping or the dad chooses. Um, they also pay somewhat less child support. And the same is true um, when dads repartner. So you can ignore the numbers. Um, but essentially, just what, I, what I'll say is, you know, if a mom repartners, right? There is the, the probability that the dad hasn't seen the child in a year. So in the next year, it goes up by about 40%. Right? So it's a big probability. Um, if, <clears throat> if the mom repartners, um, the dads pay about 15% less child support. One thing that, I, that I'll say is that, you know, the child support gap is much lower than the, than the visitation gap. So part of that might be about maternal gatekeeping, but part of that's also likely about child support, and support enforcement. Right? There's lots of consequences to not paying child support. Um, and then when moms repartner and have a new kid, you see these effects are, are bigger. OK. Um, so one thing people often wonder if child support and, 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 and visitation or, or involved fathering are complements or substitutes, they're complements. They go together. Right? So it's not, the, the thinking used to be that dads would make trade-offs and either provide time or money. And on average, that's not true. So when we talk about policy, there is truth that your child support will get um, adjusted based on your uh, custody arrangement. Right? But in general, dads are likely to either do both or neither, not one or the other. Um, so uh, a second thing that we'll see is that custody and placement, so involvement of resident fathers declines over time. And part of this is about these other family changes. So by the time a child's five, right, a, a, about a third of fathers who weren't married to the mom at birth have essentially haven't had contact with that kid in a year. So this is a lot, right? And I'm not blaming either side. I'm just putting out, right, the pattern. Um, What's really important, again, is these relationships with the mom and, how, and figuring out a way to, um, to be cooperative co-parents. And a lot of this comes back, I think, to this idea of this identity verification. Moms often serve as gatekeepers, right? And they can discourage the involvement of dads they don't get along with. They can discourage the involvement of dads who, um, who aren't paying enough child support for, for either by the agreement or, or for their liking. Um, and you know they may discourage the involvement of the dad because they have a jealous boyfriend or whatever. Um, the other thing is if you talk to dads, they often feel like their relationships with their children are contingent on their relationship or willingness to comply with what the mom wants. And sometimes it's as much as the mom wants to be romantic and I found a new partner so she won't let me see the kid. Um, and sometimes it's around, you know, well, you know, you, you know, I want you to pay money, or I don't want your new girlfriend seeing the kid, or your new kid seeing the kid. But dads, if you talk to them, what they say over and over is um, that if they don't do what the mom wants, they can't see their kid. Yeah. Is the one-third of non-resident fathers disappearing um, by the age of five, is that including all relationships at birth? So, you know, from the earlier slide, there was Married, married yeah, I'm mother. trying to remember, and I'm not 100% positive if it includes the cohabs or not. I think, to be safe, I'll say no. Um, but I, I honestly, I don't remember. So, yeah. Um, 
And so, you know, one of the things are, you know, that, you know, losing your job or having less money is highly predictive of losing touch with your kids, right? Um, so this, this, this ability to um, earn, and I think it's, it's partly, and this is, so this is more opinion, right? But, um, you know, so I, I would argue that, um, that it's only partly that you don't have enough money to do it. I think it's also partly around that father identity and that um, being able to, to meet the role of what you see as a successful father. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you just sort of quickly about social fathers. So over, um, historically social fathers have essentially gotten a bad rap, right? So that the, the, the literature from the 70s was that, that, that guys who, who marry divorced women aren't that involved with their kids, um, don't treat their kids that well, et cetera, et cetera. So this is again using that, um, the, the, the fragile families, the urban sample. And what we see is, so I'm going to compare not exes. I'm going to compare, I did a paper comparing resident dads. So these are men who have lived with the kid from birth and are still living with him at age five, right? To families where there's a new guy living with or married to the mom at age five. So these aren't dads who broke up, right? And that's not exactly a fair comparison. So we're looking at families that are all living together. And what we essentially saw is that the social dads in this sample performed, were as engaged with kids as the biological dads, or more so, shared responsibility with the mom for parenting as much as biological dads are more so, um, cooperated with the moms as much or more so. Right? Um, so the, the social dads were actually quite high quality, particularly it's largely around the ones that married the mom, more so than cohabiting. Um, so one thing we see around the cohabitors is the moms were much less likely to, to trust the, the cohabiting dads to stay alone with a child for a week um, than, than biological dads. Sorry, cohabiting social than biological. Um, and again, so I said that that, that, that that marriage gap is particularly important. However, if we look over time at how th these play out. So first point is age five. The second point is age nine. So we're only looking at families who are still together between five and nine. And what we see is, so it's married social father, cohabiting social father, married biological, mar and cohab biological. The, the biological dad's parenting behaviors, so this is an example of supportiveness. They look similar across, uh, stay relatively flat. The social dads over time decrease actually quite a lot. They're still higher, right? They're not necessarily significantly different, but they're, they're as, high, as supportive or more so than the biological dads, but they're decreasing over time. So partly what we might be seeing is an early honeymoon effect. We might be seeing um, trying to impress the mom. But one of the takeaways I want to say is, you know, social dads are not necessarily bad for kids, right? Um, two caveats. So first, high quality um, parenting behaviors are not necessarily associated with stability in relationships. So you'd, I would have thought that the better the social dad was to the kid, the more likely the, parent, the mom and the social dad stay together? Not the case. So between age five and, and nine in this sample, 80% um, uh, of the, the mom and biological dad were still together at age nine, only 43% of the social dads. Right? So they're much more likely to break up. So we do have to think about, again, even if social dads are pretty good quality, what's it mean for the kids when they break up? Right? Um, OK. So this, uh, this will be the last thing I'll show you, then we'll take a break. So this, I think, is really interesting. So I'm going to look at, this is that same urban sample. So I'm going to look at two things. What's the total amount of time parents spend engaged with kids and activities across family types? And then I'm going to look at incomes. So the, 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 this, the, the, I don't know, the slanted line is income. And so the one thing to realize is, so on average, the married, so this is at, also at age five. On average, the married families have about $77,000 on income. Cohabiting biological parents are less than half. Social parents are about half. Single moms are a lot less. So we're seeing a really big difference in resources available to kids as far as money. Okay. Second thing we'll see. So these are first two are biological parent families, mom and social dad, single mom dating the biological dad, single mom not dating the biological dad. 
So these stacks. So uh, the, 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 the bottom piece is the mom's total engagement with the kid across a bunch of activities. How much time does she, how many days a week does she do these things with her? Um, and so for each and each of these, they could go from zero to 56 points for each parent. So possibility is that social parent families can have a lot more because there's three people who could have a score of zero to 56. Um, first thing we see, moms, this, this dark group. Moms spend about the same amount of time engaged in activities with kids regardless of their family structure. So you're not seeing a lot of substituting when mom goes from being single to married to either of these guys where mom can do a lot less, right? Or chooses to do a lot less. There's not a lot of substituting. I was surprised by that. Like I thought the single mom piece would be a lot higher than the, the married. Second thing we see, married biological uh, fathers and cohabiting biological fathers are relatively similar in the amount of time. Remember, this isn't quality, this is time. Um, they spend with kids. Um, and they spend, uh, uh, you know, not as much as moms, but a lot of time engaged with kids. Third thing I thought was really surprising, look at these, the, the married social fathers. So again, this is somewhat what I told you on the, the last slide. So they actually, that white bar is bigger than that gray bar here. So they actually spend more time and are more engaged with the, with the, the kids than the biological dads who live with them. Um, the other thing we see is, Kids in the married social father family actually get the most parenting engagement time, right? So we don't know that it means the same thing to kids. We don't know that you get the same effect from, a, from spending time with a biological or social dad. The other thing is you get very little, on average, time from biological dads when moms have repartnered into, into cohabitation or into, into marriage. Um, and we also see that cohabiting biological dads are not anywhere near as involved as, as married dads. Um, last thing I want to say is about the single, right? So you see, you know, if a mom's dating a biological father, he's pretty involved, um, though, you know, clearly not as much as the others. Um, if she's not dating him, he's about half as involved. And in both cases, the dads are much more involved if the mom hasn't found a new partner. So complexity has lots of reasons for um, rather. Oh, actually, I'll do one more quick slide. Uh, I looked at two kinds of activities, TV and reading. Um, the big takeaway is moms do somewhat more reading, though relatively uh, varies a little by family structure, particularly you know, in sort of married families. Actually, it's not true. They do similar amounts of both. Um, the one thing I wanted to, to say is that you know, dads do um, in, in married biological father families do about the same amount of reading and TV. In other family types, they tend to do more TV than reading. Um, that's particularly true of the social dad, so a lot of that time is going to be around, uh, around TV. Uh, I'm not making a, a, um, an argument about whether that's good or bad, so we think of these activities as one being sort of the most cognitively stimulating reading, and TV um, not being particularly stimulating or good for kids, but TV also is gives men an opportunity to bond with kids. And some people would argue that a dad watching you know sports with his kid is a really important piece of that relationship. So this is just sort of you know no value judgment, just informational. Um, okay, so why don't we take a ten minute break? Yep. Um, okay, so so. You know, so now we've sort of talked about the family landscape from fathers and, and talked about, you know, what we know about family complexity and fluidity um, and trends, and then, you know, sort of talked about sort of, you know, um, some of the father's behaviors and, and barriers to involvement and things like that. And so now I want to start shift and talk about, you know, the policy landscape and services and working with dads. Um, so what do you guys think? So what does the, the policy landscape look like from dad's perspective? And sort of what's available to them? What are their actions, interactions with government like? Um, what, are, you know, what, are the, you know, what are the agencies that serve them like? So what do you think? Very pro-mom. Very pro-mom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just in the name of, like, whip. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so women focus, women, yeah? Yeah, high incarceration rates. So high incarceration rates, so, what, so lots of the systems they interact with or, or the system they probably interact with the most is a very punitive system. 
Yeah. So we, yeah. So I think these are all you know right on. So if we look at you know dad's interactions with government. So what do they mostly interact with? Courts. So whether that's a family court, often for child support, um, or, or or criminal court and incarceration, uh, child support enforcement enforcement. Unemployment insurance, maybe, and employment services, maybe, right? I mean, those are the sort of main systems that dads interact with um, on average. So, and then you'll have, you know, for groups of dads, mental health systems, fatherhood program, but this is the gist. And so, what do those systems largely do, with potentially, you know, the exception of maybe UI or unemployment services, are essentially, the, from dads' perspectives or men's perspectives, they see government as giving them mandates. Right? This is what you got to do. You got to pay your child support. You got to get a job. You got to go to jail or punishing them. And they often see, and if you talk to dads, I mean, so I'm not just making this up, right? This is sort of from, from not my research, but other qualitative research talking to dads, is they largely see um, that they get offered limited economic supports and services, right? And that they get lots of. Um, lots of mandates or lots of things uh, and punishments and things when they're told what to do. And then when they look at the moms, they say, well, wait a minute, you know, the mom gets an earned income tax credit, so the dad could claim it, right? But in general, one parent has to claim it. Um, it's a low income tax credit for low income working people um, and you claim a child on it, right? And they say, so usually, so, and it's the, the parent who the child lives with most of the time gets to claim it. Right, so they say, mom gets this big tax benefit, mom gets WIC, mom, you know, dads could get TANF, but it's pretty rare. Uh, mom gets child support enforcement on her side, right? She, they're collecting for me, they're giving it to her. Uh, mom is more likely to get SNAP, again, dads could get SNAP too. Mom's family's more likely to get med medical assistance. Um, you know, I put housing assistance sometimes, pretty rare for anybody to get housing assistance relatively, but moms are much more likely to get it from dads. And so when they look at these packages, right, so, and I'm not saying that moms, you know, moms are expected to work, moms have, have lots of mandates too, um, but they see a very different system, right? And I would argue there is a very different system in many ways. So we're working, um, you know, working on that. Lots of people are, and I think it's on the agenda, but there's a very different sense of interaction with government. And I kind of put Child Protective Services down there with a question mark, because, you know, I th you know, so I do work in child protective services area, and I think there are ways that child protective services can be very helpful. I'm not sure most parents who are involved with child protective services, men or women, see it as a beneficial thing. Um, so I sort of put it with a question mark. Um, so system orientation. So somebody brought up like this, this, you know, uh, you know, uh, mother supportive or, or, or agencies are focused on moms, and I think what we hear, and I think if we went out and looked. Um, typically, you know, we don't think about, you know, what are the, we don't train workers on what are the barriers to dad involvement and how do we work in general, besides in fatherhood programs, um, you know, to, to working with fathers to getting them more involved. We essentially are much more likely to say it's your fault, you're not seeing your kid or you're not paying your child support, right? Um, I think that the physical, if we think about the physical environment of most agencies, most government agencies are much more women focused. So if we look at you know, brochures and posters and flyers, um, if we look at case files often have you know, the mother's name only. They often, workers presume the mother's the primary parent. Um, the you know, often curriculum and, and, and content and resources are focused on moms. So there's, in general, you know, much less of a family or father-friendly practices, right? And so one of the things, I have a, a colleague here who does research on men's experiences going to ultrasounds when, they, when, when women are pregnant, right? And so lots of what the men say is, um, and so, and one of the reasons she sees this ultrasound and seeing the baby is sort of this magic moment and like a way to, if we can encourage men to go to ultrasounds, it gets them more, you know, connected into the pregnancy of the child. Um, and so a lot of what the men say is like, like it's like I'm invisible there, right? And this is, you know, and, the, and these are doctor's offices or clinics or hospitals that like, there's no focus on me. Like all the magazines are only for women. 
all the, you know, the way everything's set up is only for women. Granted, the woman's pregnant. I'm not you know, taking away from that. But they say you know, the doctors don't ask me questions. They don't interact with me. They just sort of focus on her. Um, and I can say, you know, you know, it's one experience, but even, you know, I have kids, and when we did the ultrasounds, um, you know, largely the questions were, and then the doctor would say, okay, and, but I felt empowered to go, wait a minute, I have some questions here, right? And, you know, not, there's, a, there's a big literature on sort of empowerment with, with authorities around, you know, being able to sort of um, express yourself in that way. Um, and so, you know, if that's even around the birth and the dads are there, like we can think about all these other systems and what they feel like from a dad's perspective. Um, okay, so what are sort of some of those implicit messages that dads are getting? Um, so I think that dads get the message often that moms are innately better parents, right? So that what we want to serve men through our employment and training, right? Um, and that we're often not thinking about their, their fathering and fatherhood needs. So in the last um, decade or so, there have been, uh, there's been a big move in, in fatherhood programs. And I think that those are trying to, to do a lot of that. Um, they're, I think they're very mixed quality. They're serving a relatively small number of men. Um, they're often, um, you know, uh, men are often somewhat coerced to, to join them and things like that. Um, and often they work, they're better around couples who are still doing well and in a good relationship than they are for a non-resident father after they've split up. Um, I think men second get the point that like mothers as, uh, deserve assistance to economically support their children and fathers are largely expected to provide this assistance and support on their own. Right? We don't say we want you to, to provide for your child, so we're going to help you get you know, this employment benefit or this cash benefit that you can pay part of for your child and those kinds of things. Um, I think you know, connected to that, that they largely still get the message that their role as a financial contributor is more, in, more um, important than their role as an involved parent. Um, and so, you know, traditionally, you know, and this isn't, you know, the 70s aren't that long ago. So all, you know, traditionally, the focus was all on their financial contributions. I mean, now we're doing more, but right, we have a child support and system, a, a, a enforcement system, a large one. We don't have a visitation support assistance, right? I mean, essentially, if you're not getting to see your kid, you got to go back to court. You got to do all this stuff. We have a much more automated system for making sure money gets collected from dads and, and given to the kid. So let's um, put it all together and talk about some, some implications. So, so we think about the big picture for policy, right? So now we're talking about sort of multiple actors with multiple roles and relationships, both within family units and across family units and across households, right? So this is getting much more complicated. So I would argue that we, we, we're often thinking about three kinds of ties, so biological ties, marital ties and co-residential ties, right? And so which ones do we privilege when? So what gives you, what obligations are attached because you're married or because you're a biological parent or because you're a resident parent, right? Um, and how do these obligations change if, you're, if, you're, if your family changes? So a lot of what people um, are grappling with now um, uh, you know, is around, you know, same-sex couples and when they split up and it's one person's biological child, how do you deal with all of these, or adopted by one person? You know, the same um, with, you know, if you move in with a woman and her kids, do you have the same obligations and rights, if you don't have any biological children with the woman, as if you married her? And if you break up, you know, what if you were a stepdad to a kid and you lived there for 10 years? So what are your obligations and rights? Do you get visitation? Right? So these are much, much more complicated. And I think that their you know, policy has to struggle with probably in different times and different places. We do want to privilege different, um, different relationships. I mean, I think the second, a second big point that we have to do is, you know, so often what we say is we want to focus on the needs of the child. And this is particularly true um, in child support 
and things like that, what the child needs or what the child would have gotten had the parents remained in this, in this two-parent, you know, um, simple relationship. But, you know, in particularly when people have kids in different households, we have to think about parents' capacities, right? We have to think about not only something, you know, equity across children and across households. So, for instance, um, you know, a father, uh, so, you know, you have a child support agreement. And if, like I said earlier, if I have two kids with one woman, it's smaller than it is if I have two kids with another woman, right? Also, that second child, with the newer child, the new woman, gets more money. So should that child, or gets less money, sorry. Should that child be penalized because they were the second child, right? Or should I penalize the first child and say, well, what we're going to do is reduce yours so that you get the same, right? Or should we just keep making me pay the same to everybody until I don't have any money left, <laughs> right? And, you know, I think, you know, if you get to a point where uh, you can get to a point where working's not worth it because y you're, it's all going to be garnished by child support, right? So I think these become much more complicated. I think the other thing is that, you know, these are fluid over time. Like, so we tend to say we're going to set this child support agreement and we come back to court when your situation changes, right? Well, people's situations change. You know, I showed you changes by age five. I showed you changes by age nine relatively quickly often, right? Um, and family, you know, and kids are spending more time in both households, um, a, a mother's and a father's. So a second is, you know, so I think we want to think about, you know, these economic goals of both private and public supports. I think we want to think about adequacy, and I think we want to think about how do we try to set up adequate support systems for, you know, all of the players. So like the, so in the simple case, the non-resident dad, the resident mom and the, and, the, and the resident kid. And then as new children and new relationships come about. Affordability, I mean, I think we need to um, set up situations where it's realistic, right, that people are going to be able to, to afford to pay what they want. So one of the areas where there's making a lot of progress on this, um, and it's somewhat controversial, um, so when men are incarcerated, right, not only do they have lots of fees around incarceration and around parole and all this and criminal justice stuff, but child support keeps going, and it's not possible to, to, to earn the money to pay your child support. So when men get out of prison, they often have a huge child support debt. I mean, it depends on how long you're in prison, right? And so then they're in this situation where not only are they supposed to pay child support, current child support, but they have to start paying back all this debt. And so while you might say you shouldn't get um, rewarded for going to prison and have your child support cut, like, there's a reality of what's affordable. And I think you know, and a lot of what we're trying to do as researchers is look into, so what's the, are men more likely to pay and pay more if you actually reduce those arrears and reduce that debt than if you don't and those kinds of things. Um, second thing is, so whether we agree with it or not, I think you know government has taken on um, behavioral roles, right? So we are involved in, her in healthy parenting practices and father involvement programs, and I think we want to think about you know how much I would argue do these programs really focus on the complexity of families' lives um, and the multiple players, rather than thinking simplistically about this new kid and the parents. Right, and the biological parents of that kid. Um, and I'm not going to say much about fertility and family formation decisions, um, except that you know, that's clearly was a, was a concern of welfare reform. It's clearly um, part of the public policy um, agenda. Um, and I think you know, there probably will be lots of debate around what, particularly under the Affordable Care Act, around um, around what kinds of, of, um, uh, uh, of contraception, et cetera, to make available and in what circumstances. Um, and there's a lot of interest um, in, in LARCs, um, long-active contribution and uh, contraceptive devices. And I think that this will be at least on the, on the debate because they've actually 
particularly among teens, um, shown pretty good results around unwanted births anyway. Um, I don't think at all this is going to change our trends, even if we enacted uh, covered locks and made them easily accessible, would change the trend toward births outside of marriage and all of that kind of thing. Um, OK, so these greater numbers uh, of, of family units and actors more, married, more matter now. Um, this importance of this shift to how we think about these roles and responsibilities and, and functioning. Um, and I would argue that this becomes important for basically any policy um, that links either your eligibility or your benefit level to family membership or family unit membership. And if we think about, so lots of the cash transfers we're doing now. So our biggest supports for low-income families now are the Earned Income Tax Credit and SNAP, food stamps, right? So the welfare program, TANF program is very small. And so if we think about both of those programs, but, but many programs, SSI, you're often thinking about household income and who's in the household, right? And so in many tax benefits, for, you know, one household has to claim it. So there is one of the big things up for policy debate, and some um, states have actually implemented, New York being one, earned income tax credit for non-custodial parents, right? Um, they're much smaller and things like that. Um, they're usually contingent on having to pay your child support. Um, so, and they're usually garnished if you owe child support. Um, but there is a move to say, okay, you know, maybe the dads, if they're paying child support, et cetera, are, um, should, should be able to claim these kids for some of these benefits too. Um, in the SNAP program, it is, so SNAP program benefit eligibility is, termed, is determined by uh, your family's food unit, so who eats together, essentially, right? In that program, it actually is possible to split a kid across households, right? But almost nobody does it. It's complicated. Um, so for the most part, a kid's going to be in one family or another family's food unit, right? And this gets complicated when kids are potentially spending half their time at each parent's house or eating lots of meals, even if mama's sole custody, maybe eating lots of meals at another house. So we did a, um, a little, just a, a pilot survey of family complexity in Wisconsin. And so it's only 200 families, it's not representative. We purposely oversampled um, complex families. And what we really wanted to look at was, how do people think about defining living arrangements? Who lives in my house? who spends time in my house, what their relationships are, and how do we share resources within and across households. So you can think of this as more anecdotal, not, you know. Um, so interesting things we found were, so in all these surveys, I tell you who, you know, single, cohabiting, married, right? Well, and so we, I think most of us have a sense of what that means. Um, cohabiting, you basically live there almost all the time or all the time, right? You, you know. Um, and I think that this varies at stages in life. I think it varies um, probably by socioeconomic status, how you define these things. But so one of the things we ask these standard questions, are you married, do you live with your, your it was all women, your husband, if you're married, um, you know, are you cohabiting, do you live together, blah, 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 if you're not, are you single, are you dating anyone? And then we ask lots of questions around time spent in households and things like that. Um, and so one of the big things that came away was like, OK, so 85% of the time, if mom says I'm married to, to, the, to a kid's father, um, we're living with him. 85% of the time, he spends most nights there. So uh, I remember if it was 25 to 30 nights a month or 20 to 30 nights a month. The other 15%, there's a huge variation in how, much they spend, how many nights they spend there. You know, so some of them are spending two nights a month together, but they live there. Right? And then you have people who don't live there but are spending 20 nights a month there. Right? So families are in the last month. And if you ask about you know, sort of who's lived here over the last year, which is what most surveys do, and then say, you know, let's go through all the people who slept here and spent one or more nights here in the last month. And then you look at what their relationships are. It's much more fluid than you'd ever get even in what I'm showing you. Right? Um, Second thing is we looked at food resources, and this is why I'm, I'm sort of tying it to the SNAP piece. Um, 
And one of the reasons, and so, so actually part of how this project was born, so we wanted to look at how families share resources within and across households. Um, and so one of the ways it, it was born is one of my colleagues worked in child welfare, and she was telling me about how she went um, on a, a home visit, and you know, it was a child welfare investigation, and there was a big sign on the, on the mom's fridge that said, don't eat this food, this food's for my kids. And so what she thought about was, oh, that's really interesting. So there are people that are there a lot that maybe are staying there or living there or that are in the household that they're not sharing food with. And so we sort of got you know, talking about, or that they don't want to share food with. Or that this, and so we started getting into like, how do we think about how families in, in complicated situations share resources across um, and within households. And so we went through then this whole you know, um, rostering. And so we actually came up with this cool method where the, the mom had a, a, and you sat across from an interviewer, and she had an iPad. And so for each thing, we'd populate like, okay, so this is person number one, how many nights did they sleep, when? And then we'd like, you know, and you could look at it in lots of different ways. So it was really helpful for their memories and letting them sort of configure their eating and, 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 and sleeping situations. Um, and we went through all of their, you know, anybody who had ever been a, child, uh, a father of their child. And then we asked them about all your children. We asked them about relatives, non-relatives. Is there anybody else? And we just kept going through these cycles. And so the food stuff was fascinating too. So the vast majority, well, so I would say the majority of the families, maybe not vast, were sharing food or food resources across family units. And so why with this, we asked them, did anybody eat any meals here? Did you take anybody out to eat a meal? Did you bring them food? Did you give them money from food? Did they take food to work? You know, every kind of configuration of food. We asked lots about where you got all your money from food. We asked where your kids got fed at you know, daycare and school and by relatives. We asked everybody who contributed food to your household um, and um, you know, whether it was meals or money and through all these kinds of things. Turns out so that, um, on, so that about 45% of, sing, of the single moms who didn't live with a partner, so they may have had relatives living there or sisters, brothers, but didn't have a romantic partner or husband, were transferring food outside of their households. And this was a really, and this is a high rate, right? We're giving food or paying for food or to other people. Um, it turns out that on average, on net, fathers of kids, so uh, if we looked at the average father, um, we looked at did the average father contribute more than they took out or take out more than they contributed, contributed more than they took out. There were tons of zeros, too, that didn't do either, right? But on average, fathers gave more food resources or, um, or, uh, you know, or food or whatever than they, than they consumed. Um, the, that was not true for boyfriends. Boyfriends consumed who didn't, who actually was lived there or didn't. Boyfriends, on average, consumed more food resources than, than they contributed. Um, so, so, you know, like I said, this is not representative. It's, and so one of the things that we want to do is expand this around um, many more aspects of resource sharing. So we're, we're looking into doing a much bigger study where we look at child care time and how children get cared for and work time and contributions to rent and lots of other, and pooling of income and those kinds of things. So I think that, that this is somewhat becomes important when we think about SNAP. So we also looked at the mom's SNAP benefits and eligibility. And on average, it averaged out to be OK. So on average, the amount of, what it, of people in their SNAP benefit, et cetera, on average was roughly the people who ate there. You know. But if you look at, so there's a distribution, right? So you bell curve, there's an average. So if you look in the tails, there's lots of mismatches. right? There's lots of families who are essentially um, providing food for many more people than are, than are in these eligibility, um, that meet their eligibility criteria. And so lots of what we're thinking about is how do we start to design policies to take that into account? And it's complicated. It's, these aren't easy, especially when there's lots of shifting quickly. right? And in some ways, you want to stick with the, the current policies because they're simpler, <laughs> right? Because there's much less administrative costs. There's much less. Re, you know, re, um, reassessing, you know, re, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so administrative burden becomes much larger. Okay. Um, so some guiding principles I would 
argue as we, as we start to think about policies. Um, so I think that what, the biggest thing to me is that it's absolutely unrealistic for policy these days to think about a current couple, whether they're together or not, and their joint child. It's just not the way most of the world is going to look in the future and looks that right now. And so I think whether these are relationship programs or income transfer programs, public or private, we need to start thinking about um, these multiple roles. Here I'm focusing on fathers, um, both at a given time and over time. So I think we should start thinking about this is the father's role now, this is the family situation, and what happens as changes occur. Um, I think that one thing we might want, and I want to think about um, is, you know, what do we want to do in father involvement and fatherhood programs? I mean, and I don't have an answer, but I think that we need to have conversations and debate about, is it just encouraging fathers to be more motivated to see their kids? Is it about motivation and access, right? So working with the moms, too, and maybe their new partners, too. Is it about, um, do we want to really focus on quality of care, too, and what does that mean, right? Um, or do we just want to get access, right? And I think these are all parts of the debate. Um, so I think for non-resident fathers, so I think for most cases, right, we want to work to promote access to children. And I think part of that is going to be um, also convincing moms that, you know, dad might have other problems in his life, right, may have problems with, you know, may have an incarceration history, may have problems with employment, may have new kids, whatever. Um, but for the most part, a dad who wants to be actively involved in most cases, right, we, I think we want to support that. Now, I also think that we need to, be, to consider the circumstances around child maltreatment, around domestic violence, in which cases um, that shouldn't be encouraged, right? So there, there's always going to be a, um, a subgroup where we have to be upfront about whether we shouldn't encourage that. Third thing, or second thing in this area I would think about is I would argue that employment, child support, and father involvement are all interrelated. Right? And I think thinking about them as three different things is a mistake. Um, there's actually a big federal um, uh, um, uh, pilot program, randomized experiment called the CSPED program. Child Support, Parenting, and Employment de Demonstration Program. It's going on in eight states. Wisconsin's one of them. Um, and the Institute for Research on Poverty is evaluating it. And so the idea is to offer men a package of services that are focused on all three things at once, so that are, that are focused on, on employment, parenting, and child support. And so they're not only interrelated, I would argue, in terms of the, sort of the identity and identity theory and that stuff and the and, and child support and parenting being complements, but I would also argue that often the same skills that you want to develop in work and in, or often the skills you want to develop in work and in parenting are very similar, right? So things like impulse control, things like, right? Thing, I mean, so lots of basic communication, being receptive to listening. So lots of these things are transferable skills, and we never really kind of think about them that way, right? Um, and if you look at lots of, uh, you know, so mom home visiting programs where we're teaching parenting skills, you know, I think, you know, lots of those programs have shown that moms do better um, economically, right, as a result of these home visiting programs, right? And I think so part of that, um, may imply that, 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 that these skills are transferable, right? Um, I think for child support, so we want to collect child support for fathers who can, can afford to pay, right? But I also think we want to improve the labor market prospects of men who can't afford to pay. And I think one thing that um, some of these CSPED sites are doing, but I think we should think about um, some subsidized, um, employment programs, and th there are some. There are some that are public. There are some that are private. Um, but I think that we should. We got to get employers involved too, and say that you know what, maybe we'll pay part of this guy's salary for the first six months or the first year, and we'll slowly taper it off. Give him a chance, 
And then if he's a good employee, you know, figure out a way. You know, the, you got to get the incentives right and all that. But I think we need to think about what are ways to to encourage employers to to um, to to hire low-income men and particularly men who have had an incarceration um, history too. Yeah, I can do a federal credit. Um, yeah. Up to eight thousand dollars, six or eight thousand dollars to come out of prison. Yeah. But the problem is you got to get these for the business. Is it worth it for them? You got to get it right, exactly. And, and they don't want turnover. And they, yeah. So yeah. But there are some programs where they literally, like somebody else is going to pay you know, their salary for X amount of time or part of their salary for X amount of time. But a lot of it really is like, you know, so there's a program, it's not particularly for ex-offenders, but um, called A Year Up, which is essentially a really intensive, um, um, it starts out with, I think they have six months of sort of somewhat classroom based and then an intensive internship. And it was started by a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who's taken this on as his full-time job. And he's gone out and gotten all these big companies right, to agree to take their graduates. And they, one of the things they found out was we can't, we can't just do employment training. Like we need lots of therapeutic practices for the men coming to, and the women, so it's not a men's program. Um, for, for, you know, we need to help them deal with lots of aspects of, of their life and not just going like, how do you do a resume, how do you interview, right? And so they have, um, in this program, there's lots of links to substance abuse, to mental health programs, all those kinds of things. It's also very demanding. So I think you, if you miss two sessions or something, you're out of the program, right? So it's very um, strict. It's, there's, a, it's, there's a book about it. It's a, but it's, a, I think, a promising program, partly because they've also gotten all these employers to sign on and get and give people um, and give people opportunities and it was on 60 minutes or 2020 or one of these two um, the other thing you know we need to think about is what does involvement mean for incarcerated dads right so think about how hard it is to 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 visit your kids if your mom doesn't want to and you're not incarcerated and you have money and you're paying child support well what about when you're in jail and what about when you're in jail three hours away? And if you want to see that kid, somebody's got to bring him. Or five hours away, right? And so, and then, you know, we want guys to, to be able to just come out of jail often with a child support debt, too. Often, usually, without a job. And jump back into the kid's life, right? I think one of the things we want to think very carefully about is being more proactive with keeping... Um, keeping kids and their fathers linked. And there are programs, right? And so one of the ways is visit video conferencing, but even video conferencing, right? Lots of families don't have it at home, right? So you may have to find a, 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 um, you, you know, a, a family resource center or, or a place to do that. Um, so maybe we want to do things like, you know, many families do have a computer, like make things like Skype more accessible and easier, or phone calls free, or, you know, but really sort of, you know, we're not going to change the incarceration system and say, you got, you, we're going to keep all men within an hour of their kids, right? But what are ways to think about keeping dads involved with kids while they're in jail? I just have a question. Um, I'm not that familiar with how child support works, and I know this would be kind of a small population, but for those fathers or mothers, for example, who are incarcerated for a lifetime, how does the child support work then? You know, honestly, I, I don't know. So, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I don't know. So, um, so there are, so it has nothing to do with the lifetime. So there are lots of programs. Some of the CSPED sites are working with um, if the father is incarcerated, when they get out, you know, maybe for every dollar child support they pay, they'll forgive two, right? Or they'll, so ways to bring down. Um, Milwaukee did an experiment where the moms had to agree to it, right? So, because the, the moms owed the money. Um, that where while the fathers were incarcerated, if the moms agreed, they'd stop, so they'd have their existing debt, but they'd stop, cr you know, cranking up debt and things like that. So there are, so this is an area where people are experimenting. Um, and I think we actually, so I don't know about the lifetime issue, um, and I think we just don't know that much about how these programs are working yet. So. You know, you talk about, there's also those, there's court fees you talk about. Yeah. So if they don't pay those, they're going to end up back in jail. Yeah, exactly. And if their license is revoked, right. you know, try to get that back to be able to go, but you're not on a trans line. Yeah. yeah. There's all these. Right. It's place. expensive to have a criminal history, very expensive. 
right? And so some of the, pro so there are, uh, so I, I don't know that there are as many programs um, working on eliminating fees altogether. There are, there's been a lot of action around, um, and this isn't my area, so I don't know a ton about it, but around collection practices and interest rates and, and you know, there's a big New York Times Magazine article about the sort of seedy underbelly of trying to collect these and people end up in jail for a year because they have a bunch of money owed on old parking tickets and this and that. So there is some action around trying to work on those. I don't know that it's a national um, priority at this point, but I think that that's an area where there's room to try to reduce some of those costs because I think people see that as being much more expensive than recouping the fees to begin with, right? Um, so I'll tell you anecdotally, so a big policy change, well, hasn't been enacted yet, but we're hoping. So Maria Kanchin, one of my colleagues here, did um, some work for w Wisconsin around child support. So if your child gets put in foster care, um, the county has the right to go after child support and have you pay child support to the county for the, for the child while the child's in, in foster care. Uh, turns out that there's a lot of variation across counties in Wisconsin on whether they pursue it and when and all of that kind of stuff. So she did a bunch of research looking at essentially the costs and benefits of doing that. And it, it, we're much better off not charging the family's child support. So the kids come back home quicker. When they come back home, they end up staying there longer, right? They, um, you know, the parents are in a much better financial position if we don't do that. And I, so there's, and now that I know the Department of Children and Families um, was really taken by these findings. And I think that there's gonna be, well, so the election may, you know, you never know what's going to happen after next Tuesday, but I think there's going to be a real push in Wisconsin to discontinue the practice of collecting child support. I can't guarantee it um, for child welfare families. Um, but these kinds of fees are, yeah, they're extremely expensive. Um, and I think, you know, finding ways um, to, and some of the, so some of the CSPED sites are also saying, okay, if you participate in this program, we'll reinstate your driver's license if you lost it for child support, and as long as you're in the program, You'll keep your your distance. Yeah, but the only problem is, is, I used to work for CPS, and uh, the thing is, is that taxpayers pay for um, these kids. Yeah. They, the parents aren't. So yeah. when they are in these programs, and you're not collecting money for certain things, yeah, yeah. for everything, um, someone has to pay for it. Oh, absolutely. You know, so somebody. But what is? Yeah, so absolutely, but what, I, but what I'm arguing is the extra time they spend in foster care is much more expensive to the taxpayers than the child support's paying for, that, and that's the difference. So yeah, any of these programs, there's costs, and who's going to pay them, right? So, and if we say, while you're in jail, you're, we're, we're going to stop your child support arrears, the mom may be getting less money. She's certainly entitled to less money. What's not clear is, will she actually get more or less? if the dad comes out with a big debt or not. And I think that's what we need to figure out. And what's the right level to send it, to set it, right? Um, yeah, and so most, uh, and generally these programs, they don't stop, if you go to jail for non-payment of child support, they don't stop your debt then, right? <laughs> so, um, okay. So what do we think about, so these sort of key challenges for, for, for serving dad. So I, so the, you know, my take is, one thing we need to be able to do, I don't think in general fathers have had the best experiences with social service systems and with government, right? And I think one of the things we first need to be able to do is reach them and make initial contact, right? And so for men who may have outstanding warrants and may have reasons that they don't really want to be involved with systems, right? So one is just making initial co contacts. The second is, like, how do we get them in the door? And I think we actually have to be able to convince them that we have something that we can offer you, right? That we're not going to just saddle you with mandates, right? And that we're gonna, what we're going to do is provide a service that is likely to help you meet some goal, whether it's better employment, whether it's getting to see your kids, whether it's um, whatever. So I think part of it is this convincing. Um, and I think that, that, that you know, we have to sort of change the message they're getting from, you know, we're telling you to do this to we have services to offer you and this is what we can help you with. Um, and so one of my 
concerns about this CSED program, this, this eight site, is that it's largely through the child support system. And what we're trying to do is change the thinking about this child support system from a system that comes and takes your money to a system that serves you and is helping you to get better employment, see your kids more, and be able to play your child support. And I don't know if that's doable or not, but that's what, what, what's, what we're trying to do. I think then once we start, right, we got to keep them engaged. So if it's an employment program, right, you know, if there aren't results, dads are going to fade out, fade away, right? If you know you have a caseworker, but they're you, you, and you're paying more child support, but you're not getting to see your kid, dads are going to fade away, right? So we actually have to to, to get to a customer satisfaction pace. Um, again, I want to come back to this, you know, focus on this complexity. Like, you know, we need to think about not just this particular kid and this particular family. Um, and I want to, you know, again, like include and involve social fathers, right? So we don't want to say, you know, you may not have no kids, but you live in a household with kids. I think we want to be able to include you. Um, so a couple things we know. So when we do programs with fathers, and this is particularly true um, around, well, it's true around both employment and around, um, t and, and around fathering. Um, Programs that are experiential, that are combinations of practice and education, that are not like this, <laughs> you get sitting in seats listening to somebody, work much, much better, right? So if possible, we want kids to either be there or you have a session that's among the dads. And some of this, these dads um, sort of mentoring and, and, and sessions where, the, where there's you know, communication sessions are good. But often, if you can get the kids there afterwards and practice skills, those are good. Um, the, um, so a lot of it's really got to be about, about the, the you know, interactive. Um, I also think you know, the programs that seem to be the best are if you can get the women, the, the kids' moms of the non-resident dads involved too. So that's hard. It's much harder. And you get a much more select group of people who are already getting along, right? And it becomes even more complicated you know, when new partners issue. But those, you know, to the extent that you can get more people to sit down and think about how we're going to work this out, they seem to work better. Um, I'll just say a couple quick things about um, social fathers. So one thing is, I think domestic partner benefits are going to become increasingly important, right? Not only for same-sex couples, but given how high incarceration, or incarceration, cohabitation is, particularly cohabitation as a social parent. Right? And so how do we think about parental leave policies when your partner's kid gets sick? Right? Or, OK, we're, we're moving, you know, the, uh, so we have a mandate for being phased in for health care. Who covers the kid? The married stepfather, the non-resident biological father, the cohabiting stepfather. So there's lots of these, um, you know, details to work out across these programs. Pensions and survivors benefits. So largely, pensions and survivors benefits and historically have only gone to married spouses. Well, when less people marry and they cohabit, what are we going to do about, you know, about um, um, those kinds of supports? Um, often, you know, if you're not in a common law marriage state, right, what kind of um, support might you get uh, get after a breakup if you were never married, financial support. So all of those kinds of things. Um, so I think that one of the things that we want to, I think child support enforcement, you know, it may be important in the context of social fathers, right? So we don't see the same drop um, in, in, in child support that we do in visitation when moms repartner. Um, so I think that there is um, a, an important role for that. Um, we also, there's some evidence that receiving child support, because it's more money, and money's good for kids, is good for kids. Um, at the same time, I think it's really complicated to, to design policies that work for everybody. Um, I think if we think about marriage and fatherhood and relationship programs, um, I think that, you know, the, I've mostly said this kind of stuff, focus on, you know, more than the current couple um, and think about you know, the, the non-resident father involvement, even if it's a fatherhood program that's focused on mom and, and guy are about to have a kid or have just had a kid, and we're working on our fatherhood program, um, it's really important to think about those other actors and how they play out. Um, 
And then Child Protective Services, I haven't said too much about, but largely Child Protective Services historically has either seen social fathers as a big risk or ignored them altogether, right? Um, and fathers often, if they don't live there, have now there's much more of a move to get the fathers involved. But historically, if they didn't live in the family, were, were, were um, ignored often. I think Child Protective Services should essentially do neither. I think they should approach these men as a possible resource um, and, and a possible ha uh, helping. And at the same time, you know, if they're investigating a family, check out whether they're a risk. Um, it is true that kids that live, despite the good things that I told you about social fathers, that kids that live with social fathers are considerably more likely to be involved with child protective services and to be maltreated than kids who live in two biological parent families. It is not true that they're more likely to be involved with child protective services than kids that live in a single mother family. So social fathers are not, in and of it themselves, necessarily a risk. Now, there is there is a subgroup that's a very high risk, but on average, they're not necessarily a risk. Um, so I think child protective services can have a much more open thing. So what can providers do? So you know, we do these cultural competence uh, assessments of agencies. Why don't we do father friendliness or male friendliness, right? So I think we can think about how do we address the needs and show the value of fathers. Um, I think we can think about fathers who want to be more involved, to think about doing, you know, taking advantage of non, you know, uh, traditionally male-focused policies, right? So some of this is going to apply to upper-income people because lots of lower-income people don't get paid leave or don't get leave at all and those kinds of things. But we can think about flex time or family family practices in the work source. We can think about you know, in working with, with parole and corrections or working with employment programs or whatever, thinking about what are your family needs and responsibilities too. Um, I think that the, you know, this, these co-parenting relationships are important and, you know, for, for to the extent that we can get, um, uh, uh, you know, partnerships uh, across households, regardless of marital status, I think that could be important. Um, I think this, this second to last point is really important. So often workers take as truth what the mom tells them, right? And I think it's really important to correct the information, either because the mom doesn't have the same inf have access to all the information, or because people have different perspectives. And I think it's really important to, to balance both what the moms say and what the dads say. Um, and then I think men and, and women need sort of need um, Need, need, need concrete services. Um, so last thing, so you know, we want to try to get away from these stereotypes that fathers are about money and not nurturing or important in those ways. I think we need to involve fathers more around designing their own uh, father-friendly and father-sensitive practices. Um, I think we need to think about reaching out to fathers' ranges of, of um, people that they're involved with. Um, I think, you know, being a father is relatively fragile, and there are lots of barriers to involvement. And I think we need to recognize that and recognize that, um, that, that fragility and complexity. Um, we already talked about these, these child support. Um, child, there can be some child support incentives. Um, and lastly, I think what's really important is to also think about these other more structural problems that are affecting you know, all the members of these families. Um, so I'm about five minutes over your time, I apologize. Um, I'm happy to stay around and answer questions. I'm sure most of you want to get out of here um, or you know, take emails, et cetera. So thank you very much. <laughs>